I didn't want to have to record this again, but I realized when I did my IG live that I wasn't gonna be able to upload it to YouTube, so now I know. Um, and this conversation is not for the, it's not for the babies. I'm gonna preface this talk letting you know that this conversation really isn't for the youngins, but it's a conversation that needs to be had nonetheless. And um, I wanna start off by saying, you know, I'm a religious person, but I'm also a spiritual person. Um, I'm religious in the sense that that's where I obtain my ideals primarily from, as far as my core values. But I'm a spiritual person in the sense that I'm very connected and grounded to the world that I live in and very aware of the human condition. And oftentimes because of religion, you know, these, these texts are ancient texts. These are not new texts. And so some people feel a little bit of out of touch with the Bible, with the Torah, with the Quran, um, with the Bhagavad Gita, whatever, because they feel like it's not speaking to their current condition and things that are going on currently within their reality. And so I draw a lot of my principles from you know my religion, my texts. Obviously, I don't adhere to customary um, dressing in the way that I present myself um, because I'm such an advocate and proponent of free will. And so, you know, God's will, of course, my creator's will trumps everything, but also free will is something that I very much respect um, with, within my personal journey and other people's personal journeys. I have a philosophy. You are free to operate your free will at the highest level as long as it's not infringing on anyone else's. And so I really want you to acknowledge that I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of uh, free will and um, any attempt to impose, you know, your will on my life is a violation of my free will. And I was reflecting earlier on Paul Mooney, who recently passed away, and um, he was one of my favorite comedians because he was so honest and unfiltered and took on, you know, race issues and social issues like head on. And he was hilarious, he was hysterical. And I actually had the chance to meet Paul um, some time ago, it was at the Howard Theater, which is a renowned theater here in Northwest Washington, DC, not far from where I stay. And I was working there at the time. And it was um, Paul and Dick Gregory. Dick Gregory is you know, a social advocate and he's also a comedian. And it was the two of them, they had gone on um, like a small like tour together. And they came to the Howard Theater to do a comedy show. I think they were there for like either three days or a week. It was more than one day, I know that for a fact. And, um, you know, Paul greeted me generously. You know, he smiled at me. And, um, you know, I felt his spirit, you know what I mean? I just felt his, his spirit, like, like this is a good person. And when I was over there, I remember that they had lied to Paul and basically told Paul that I was a prostitute, that I was a hooker. And he went off, you know, because he basically looked at that as an insult to his intelligence. And he's like, you know, I'm, he, Paul's been in the game for decades. I mean, long time he's been in the entertainment industry. Paul has done stand-up all over the world, from Hollywood to Tokyo to any place you can imagine. He's very well versed in the entertainment industry, especially being you know groomed uh, in Hollywood to some degree, to some degree. He knows a prostitute when he sees one, so he's like, "You are insulting my intelligence by telling me this girl is a hooker. I know a hooker <laughs> cross culturally. You know, I know West African hooker, uh, Russian hooker, uh, Hollywood hooker. You know." So he knew that it was a lie. And then he went on this, he went off on basically how they love to degrade and condescend black women. He was just going off. Like, what is it about them? They just love, they just love to tear apart black women. They just love to see black women like going off. He was going off. And Dick Gregory was like, ain't that the truth? You know, standing right by his side, like, yeah. That's exactly what they'd love to do. You're right, totally right. And so, you know, he was just basically going on about his, how he observed this obsession um, with our degre degradation and how you can be living like a very like prim and proper life. You can be living a very righteous life, but they will like 
always trying to make you seem or appear as if you are, um, you know, doing something that's, you know, what many would consider as indecent. And um, times have changed quite a bit when we talk about this very taboo subject. But, um, you know, people may say, oh, you're talking about Paul right now. And it's not just because of his passing. That's, that has a lot to do with it. And um, reflecting on how good I felt for his advocacy, that somebody actually stood up for me. And that left such an imprint in my mind. I'll never forget him from, from that. Um, but also, you know, I really do, do believe Paul was hysterical. Paul was hilarious. But an old story. Why do I tell these old stories, you guys? What, you may want to know, like, why is Kim telling these old stories? Well, I need you to learn from my life, people. You know, when I, and I'm here for a long time and a good time, by the way. I'm here for a long time and I'm here for a good time. But in my old years, right, when I'm 103 and it's time to go to those pearly gates and I'm pleading on my behalf negotiating with my creator on why he should let me in. He's gonna ask me, did you do everything that you could for the people? And I'm gonna have to look at him and, be, and answer truthfully. And so I need you to learn from me. I need you to, I'm telling these stories as lessons, people. As lessons, please don't don't, you don't have to go what I you don't have to go through what I've been through. You don't have to. And I went through these very tough, excruciating, humbling, humiliating, heart-wrenching, heartbreaking life lessons, so you don't have to learn from me. And the bottom line is I do love you. I really do love you. I love you despite you. I love you in spite of you. And my love for you is not contingent upon how kind you are to me. I understand that you are deeply wounded. You know, I'll use the analogy of a psychologist dealing with somebody with Tourette's or somebody working at a drug clinic. The addict may not be the kindest to you when they are going through withdrawal. And that's maturity, understanding that. I understand that my people are deeply wounded in a society that has created the perfect environment for pain and wound and suffering and lack of healing and psychosis and resentment and animosity and hatred. Hatred towards people who look like you based off of being bred to hate yourself. If I'm a reflection of you in any kind of way or, or, or whatever, we're not even just talking about black people here, we're talking about people. People are wounded. If you've been conditioned because of your heart being so torn apart, where all now you can do is hate, you're just filled with hatred and I embody love, there's gonna be some resistance to my existence. I don't take these things personally. If you've turned your back on your creator or God or religion because you've been through so many things, so many traumatizing events that you're like, you're, you hate God because you ask yourself, well, why? Why would God put me through this? If he's our creator, if he's the, and if I embody godliness, it's not me. It's the God in me that people hate. So I don't take it so personally. And healers know that. Healers know that many of the people who need the healing might have very vile attitudes. Just like a psychologist knows that the people that are going to see them may have some mental health challenges or a therapist knows that there may be some mental health challenges. And not to take things so personally if they're spewing out things against them, like a doctor knows that his patients might be in pain. And if you're like, ah, this pain, you motherfucker. A doctor may not take that personally. Right? It's a part of the work. It's a part of the job. I mean, nobody's signing up to be abused here. Don't get me wrong. I have my limitations, but I also have the understanding of the condition of mankind. 
And so yes, I love you despite how you treat me and despite how you talk about me, I know, and despite how you condescend me behind my back, I'm aware. I'm aware of it all. But beyond that, I began to meditate and ask myself, you know, in, I was in this situation in DC and I was like, man, it's been going on for a long time. You know, you guys, I've spoken about this before. And uh, my main question, it wasn't so much like them, but I was just like, what am I exuding? You know, what, what am I energetically giving off to make people believe that they could exploit me, that they could prostitute me? You know, what, what, what makes them even feel like I would even be down for something like that? And on a side note, part of the reason why I have come up with, like, learn from me so you don't have to go through these things. Ladies, only make love to men you love and only make love to men who love you back because I'm not approved when it comes to making love. I feel like part of love making is showing your partner how much you love them and pleasing your partner in the highest capacity. I'm, I will never tell a lady to hold back when it comes to who she loves and who loves her. Whatever he likes. If he likes role playing, he likes you to dress up, he likes you to talk to him in a certain kind of way, why not? If that man really loves you and that man is helping you and you're helping him and he's doing for you and he's protecting you and providing for you and all those things, yeah, go there. There's nothing wrong with that. But don't do it for somebody who doesn't love you because here's the problem, you risk, right? So if you are going all out for a guy that is not your like your guy you risk especially if he doesn't operate in an integral fashion like these are these are private things you know like your intimate life your sex life is private and that's why when you love somebody you should trust them and they should trust you because you're over there and you're doing all the things that you feel like are pleasing to your partner with giving designating a certain amount of um your trust to that person you know, like, for example, if you and your partner wanted to make a tape, a sex tape, because it aroused you in the bed, it aroused him in the bedroom, and maybe he wanted to make love to you while watching you guys making love. Who knows? Whatever. You know, people have all types of things that they like. That would be somebody that you have to be like that with. That should be your husband. That should be like somebody that you have an incredible bond with because... Imagine you share that experience with somebody and then they take advantage of the trust that you lent to them, you know? So I, I really want to preface this conversation with like, ladies, please trust me, like make love to the men that the man that loves you and the man that you love. And I started to, you know, question like why, you know, because prostitution is the oldest profession and Cross-culturally, I mean, in ancient Kemet, you know, wherever, globally, there's always been women who have profited from selling their bodies. It's like, there's always been concubines, you know, there's not, like, even the Bible talks about concubines, even the Quran talks about concubines, ancient texts talk about concubines. This is nothing new, guys. What's new is probably the more acceptance of it, you know, but... Um, the existence of concubines or prostitutes has, has, is not new. And so, especially with the economy and with the culture being more accepting of um, this idea of, you know, women selling their bodies for profit and whatnot, you know, you hear it in the music and whatnot. I kept wondering why me? Because there was no shortage of women, like, there was no shortage of women, from my perspective, uh, that were willing to sell their bodies, you know, in exchange for a monetary exchange. I told you guys when I was in L.A., I was in L.A., and I was on set. I auditioned for a couple roles. Um, I was in L.A., and one role was I was a dancer, for, like an extra, very small part for a Mario Van Peebles movie. And I met a girl on set who um, was an escort, a call girl. She She was a striving actress slash model slash escort slash call girl slash uh, stripper. This was not uncommon in LA. 
that a lot of the girls that were on set, you know, who were striving for to be models and striving to be actresses or whatever, were also call girls. And what surprised me coming from the East Coast was that I met so many women that were so open about it. I mean, like, there was no shame involved. They just were like, yeah, this is what I do. This is how I earn a living. And it was very, very much more popular in Los Angeles as far as just being open about their lifestyle than it was on the East Coast. But I just kept wondering, like, with all these women that I was meeting, and I met some of like, the most beautiful girls who, you know, were strippers, who were call girls, who were escorts, um, knockouts, you know, but this is how they chose to make their money. Um, and so I began to realize, like, there's, there's no shortage of women that are willing to sell their bodies. Like, it's very, 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 very popular. So I'm like, why me? Like, why would there be, um, you know, even a plan? Like, why would people be, like, bending over backwards or, like, really desperately trying to, like, make me a prostitute when there's so many prostitutes? So many. And so I started to think, like, you know, all women aren't built the same. You know, maybe it's you know, my, my, my specific body part that's in high demand. I'm not gonna get too explicit. And then I thought also that, you know, there's this kind of concept, like there's this like age old kind of um, need to like turn a good girl bad or whatever. So maybe that's it. Um, you know, I, I'm not the only attractive woman. I've met so many beautiful women, like of all races, of all backgrounds. So I'm like, it's not my looks. Cause there's so many pretty girls. There's so many, beautiful, beautiful women. So I'm like, it's not that. And so I just kept trying to figure out like, why me? Like, why would there, would there be such a desperation for me to sell my body? You know, with the culture and the economy, there's just no shortage. To the point where they were so desperate that they were calling me one and I wasn't one. Telling Paul Mooney, telling people, you know, telling boyfriends, exes your boyfriends at the time. Hey, you know that girl that you think is like a, the greatest thing that you've ever met? Well, yeah, she's for sale. You can buy her. Like no, most men don't want a woman with that type of reputation unless they're extremely open-minded. And so it was very deliberate, you know, to like run guys away, hoping to concoct a situation that would leave me with no options, going to my job and starting rumors, getting me fired, messing with my money, telling management this lies about me, tarnishing my character. To, like, it was like literally like the damn like mafia, like the DC freaking mafia or whatever, like after me, like trying to force me into prostitution. This is what the, this is the shit, this is like the fuck shit I've been dealing with guys. And so basically trying their best to create a situation for me that I would have no options because whoever, I don't know, whoever saw me maybe working at the bar one day and was like, I want her, somebody. And when they were informed that I was not for sale, it was a problem. You know, there's some very powerful people in this town. I don't, I don't know. I don't have all the answers. I don't, I don't know everything, but I kept asking myself, why me? And especially during alone time, you know, my mind starts going, I start kind of thinking like about various scenarios that would, that would put me in a position like this. But what they fail to understand is that like everybody's standards couldn't be applied to me because I was a little bit different. I do consider myself somewhat of an anomaly. I have not that many subscribers or followers on social media. You guys see, I still post every day. I'm still on here, running my mouth. I don't have a record deal, you guys see. I'm still creating music. I'm still doing choreography, making music almost every single day without a record contract, without anybody paying me currently to do so. I'm not, I don't have a modeling contract. You see. I'm still working out. I'm still fit. I don't have a ring on my finger. I'm not working out to keep it tight for my husband. So why? Why? Why do you do all these things and you don't have this external validation or incentive externally to do it? Because I do it for me, people. 
That's why I do it for me. I do it because I like to do it. I do it because it's what I want to do. That is my free will. And I want people to really get into that mentality, especially women. You are not here for someone's consumption. You're not here for someone's consumption. Your existence, our creator didn't make you to be consumed by somebody. You stand alone in your entirety and all that you bring to the table. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's your free will. It's your free will. Like, I can't tell a woman, don't prostitute yourself. I would, so, I would strongly recommend that you don't because uh, mostly soul ties, and I'll probably go into a little bit more detail in another day what soul ties are, but um, a lot of people are out of their fucking minds because of soul ties, because they ended up making love to somebody that they had no business making love to and now they can't get their demons out of them. And I know this sounds kooky, but it's very, very real. So prostitution really opens you up to um, having intercourse with some very, um, let's say, unspiritually clean individuals. And you can attach, they can attach um, certain entities to you, like possessions, essentially. Um, possession goes through portals or People get possessed through their open holes. I know that sounds bizarre, but your ears. So you have to be careful with the music that you're listening to because the music that you're listening to, you're consuming through your ears. The food that you're eating, your mouth, is something that allows you to consume things that can be not good for you. Your eyes, what you're watching, what you're tuning into, that is another access point. And your holes, your anus, and your vagina. A man can possess you through sex. Um, I've seen it. This is how good girls go bad. She's cool. She was a church girl. She meets up with this guy and he turned her out. Case after case after case of this. Like she was a good girl. What happened? She linked up with some kind of guy who turned her out and now she's doing all types of freaky, freaky things. She is not in her mind. She's literally under mind control. Some may say digmatized. She got digmatized. She got a spell put on her by that, by that magic wand. And all, all dick is not good dick. Excuse my French, like I told you guys, this conversation is really not for the kids. And so, to me, some people say, well, you know, we're free. We're free to have sex with whoever. It's our body, it's our choice. I get you, and I told you already, I'm a pr proponent of free will. It is your body, it is your choice. But once you share your body, how much are you operating within your choice? Whose choice is it now? If you're under possession, if somebody has your mind under control, is it really you? So that's really my main incentive to tell you to be very cautious with who you, who you decide to be intimate with. Is that person a person that you spiritually can, can uh, vouch for? And so I kept asking myself why, you know, they went, I mean, they were my money, they went after my money, they went after my love life, they went after trying to ruin my self-esteem just so I could be for everybody. I'm like, why me? When there's a surplus of women that are trying to, to do it. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't like everybody else. You know, I didn't, I, I got to a point where I wasn't, reliant on other people's validity uh, for me to make my own moves, do my own thing, you know? Like, I, I didn't, it got to a point where I didn't even really care about my reputation. Like, if you were that idiotic to believe something, like like with Paul, Paul was like, fuck out of here. I know a hoe when I see one, that's some bullshit. This girl's no hoe. But if you were naive enough as a man to say that that was going to be um, the barrier or the reason why you, you didn't select me as a mate, then I felt as if those people were actually working for me because I didn't want a man who was gonna be that weak-minded. I knew that whatever my purpose was that the creator had for me was gonna be a big purpose. I was gonna need a soldier, I was gonna need a rider, I was gonna need a strong man beside me, not somebody who was weak-minded, easily persuaded, and easily, you know? Because who knows what's next? If you get persuaded out of that, then you can get talked into this and you can get talked into that. Next thing you know, you're Owen. Because you're that female-minded, who knows? You know, so I need a very strong-minded individual. And um, I began to see things from the, from the perspective of, well, maybe they're kind of actually doing me, you know, a service. I needed somebody who rocked with me and said, I don't care. My love is unconditional. 
I don't care what you say. I believe in her. She, to me, looks honest. She seems like she's got a good character. This is the woman that I love. I don't care what. I don't care what you say about her. That's my girl. And so, all of the things that were happening and on an external level and the environment, you know, I was, I began to use for my favor. I'm like, well, you know what? I don't really need to be going out like that, you know? Regardless if my name is XYZ or whatever in the streets, I don't really need to be going out like that. I got music to create. You know what I'm saying? Like, I got, I got music to create. I got choreography to create. I got dancing to do. So it all worked in my favor. And I understood that my self-worth would not be placed in other people's hands. And really the only um, being that I was scared to lose was the creator that I worshipped. And so all things work to your rise. But back to this conversation, you know, um, one of the reasons I love Paul so much is because he was brutally honest. And brutal honesty is a quality that I admire and respect in people. Like, I, I really respect people who are candid and fearless about their candidacy. And so, you know, I will never be a hooker. I'm, I was not a hooker. I was not a prostitute or anything like that. Um, I love, you know, that this is my personal ethic and this is what... I have chosen to do and not to do with my life and that's something that I can define. I am allowed to define my own standards that I set for myself, period. And it's laughable to me that all their efforts, you know, were, were still panned out to nothing. Because if that was their objective, it didn't matter. I don't care what you want. I want her to do this, I want her to do that. I am me. I am me, I am Kinsey, I am the guide of my life, I am the master of my fate, I control my destiny with the guidance of my creator, it's about what my creator wants, and being the being that created all of creation, yeah, he's gonna win, his will for me is gonna win, I don't care if the whole world wants me to do this, I don't care if the whole world wants me to do that, I, I don't care, so it's like a waste of breath, and I've told, the, like, I've been very clear, like, it, it's, it's coming down to like whatever you do or try to do to me, you do to yourself. So like you not stopping is not, doesn't, it's not going to affect me. It does not affect me. I'm still gonna have my way. I'm still gonna be what I'm here to be. I'm still gonna live my purpose and my destiny. And all you're doing is making it worse for yourself. All you're doing is inheriting karma for yourself. So I laugh, like keep up, you know, keep talking trash about me and keep, it's cool. So you can make it worse for yourself. But on a side note, you know, really the main note is I understand that the world is at a deficit of love and many people have really even lost their belief in love. You know, even some of these men are aware that their wives don't love them. And some of these women are aware that their husbands don't love them. I actually had a man tell me one time that he did, didn't believe that his wife uh, cared if he stepped outside of their marriage or not. He, didn't, he thought that really the only thing that would disturb her is if he like lost his job or the, the ability to provide. Like that was all that she cared about. The checks that he brought home. She's like, he's like, I don't think she cares. Like I really don't believe that she cares who I sleep with at all. As long as I bring the money home. And what does that mean? I mean, I'm sure like a guy in a situation like that, his heart is kind of broken. Especially if he loves his wife, but that's her disposition. I'm sure it doesn't, you know, men, they talk about women getting our feelings hurt. Men get their feelings hurt too. When a man realizes he's in a relationship with a woman who does not care about him, but only cares about his money, what, how does that make him feel as an individual? Like what, I'm only a cash cow? That's the only, like in my entirety, that's all I am to you? You don't care about my mind, you don't care about my heart, you don't care about anything about me but the money that I can bring home to you? Like you're minimizing that whole person to just what they can do for you. And so when we have these type of conversations, we can't vilify men, we need to stop vilifying men because you'd be surprised what, will, what women will turn a blind eye to for material comforts. 
They don't care. Like, some of these women don't care. They don't care what a man does as long as he can bring home the bacon. And so this deficit of love is not just like women are like dying for love, men are dying for love. Like men are like dying for love right now. And um, often, truth be told, and I told you guys, I just, I just gotta be honest in this conversation. Often it's the jump off, it's the side piece that is even closer to the man than his wife. Like you've heard like these things like in the culture, no pillow talk because men get really comfortable, you know, laid up with their side chick and they start talking about things that they haven't expressed in a long time because they can't talk about it within their social circle and they can't talk about it within, you know, with, with their lives. Start telling their, their side chick all types of things about them, just opening up. Because chances are, the wife is on some sort of like a pedestal. The side chick might be a little bit more down to earth. And he doesn't feel like he's gonna get judged by saying some, some of the things that he's been going through by the side chick. And he also has less to lose. You know, men sometimes feel trapped by their wives and their wives' expectations. And they often, you know, select them because, um, you know, maybe not because they love them, but because they look good on paper and upheld a certain public image that they wanted to uh, present to the world. Um, whereas the side chick or the hoe or whatever, you know, might, might also do freaky things that the wives won't let them do. So oftentimes the jump off looks nothing like the wife. The jump off might be the side piece, you know, might be, might be their fantasy. But I would say the goal for ladies is to be the side chick and the wife all in one. There are some men that are just prone to step outside of their marriage and that's just who they are. But I think part of your obligation, if, he, if he's exerting effort to make sure that you are pleased in the ways that you need to be pleased, I think that it's only appropriate to reciprocate that. Exert effort to please him in the way that he, he needs to be pleased. And so I'm not, you know, when it comes to relationships and it comes to couples, I never tell a woman, I tell a woman don't be a hoe because of spiritual soul ties, but I never tell a woman don't be a freak. You're allowed to, like, do whatever you want to satisfy your partner, whatever. They like to role play, you want to dress up, you want to, whatever things that they like to do, do it. Go there because that's a level of intimacy that you guys should have. There should be no boredom in the relationship not with books like the Karma Sutra and ladies like the one I'm about to describe to you. Like there's all types of avenues to spark up your relationship if you have the desire to. But honestly, ladies, we often think that it's how beautiful you are that, you know, it's not a matter of the beauty. You know, sometimes men are into women who aren't the most beautiful, but they are the most pleasing to them sexually. And besides all those things, the sexual pleasure and beauty, it really, really comes down to your heart. Not your lashes, ladies, your heart and the love that you have inside. Because right now, love is at a extreme deficit. We are in a pandemic, a deficit of love. And so anyways, getting back to the talk about prostitution, I met this Swiss lady in San Diego. I was developing a radio show and I needed a sex therapist for the show. When I was in DC and I had my radio show, I had a relationship counselor. But I wanted to do a show because we got so much popularity with the relationship show. Everybody was like, oh yeah, we've got to tune in to the relationship show. People were, that was drawing probably some of the most, the largest amount of interest. The relationship show, I had a, um, a therapist who was, uh, she was a Howard graduate and she had opened up her own practice recently. And she gave a lot of like really great advice to couples. And I believe might have end up, ended up doing her own spinoff show because there was so much interest in her advice, giving relationship advice, which I'm no expert at. So I let the expert handle that. But because there was so much interest with these relationship talks, I wanted to take it further when I moved to SoCal and I wanted to get another relationship counselor, like a, a therapist, but I also wanted to get a sex coach. I wanted to get a sex therapist. 
And, you know, between the two, we were gonna kind of like have some very interesting conversations about everything under the sun, everything, like you name it. I wanted to go there when we talked about sex and relationships. And so um, this woman had traveled around the world and she got trained by sex masters. I know that sounds funny to you guys, like what's a sex master? I didn't know what one was until I met the, the lady. She basically said that there's people out there that are sex masters, which means that they have studied the human body to the extent that they know all of the um, like points on the body that are sexually stimulating. And like all of a man's G-spots, a woman's G-spots, what most women, you know, find like arousing, like all of the things like within your body that are stimulating, they've mastered it, they've studied it and they got it down to a science. And so she was, she was, she had studied, she was like a protege of the sex masters that she met along her journey and was let down that her business had slowed down when she moved to America. And, you know, part of her work as a sex therapist was touch. And this is where it kind of got tricky for her, you know, and I want to make this point that I'm both religious and spiritual. And so, you know, a religious person may be like uh, appalled by this idea, but um, from a spiritual standpoint, I can understand it. And so, you know, my religious side is really my ideals. My spiritual side is really a bit more practical, grounded and realistic that these type of things do, can, do um, occur. And she considered herself a sexual healer. And one of the main issues with her clients was erectile dysfunction. She dealt primarily with men with the issue of ED, um, you know, erectile dysfunction. And she would often invite the wife in or their partner in, their mate, into her sessions. And, um, you know, she basically would teach the wife how to obtain and maintain an erection um, from a whole on a holistic level without them having to like pop a pill or have like some sort of invasive surgery um, she was able to like, kind of like break barriers um, because they say that every ailment is like there's a, a underlining like when an ailment when, when an ailment surfaces or dysfunction or disease surfaces it's typically um, an underlying thing, you know, mentally. It's usually developed, the seed is planted in the mind. So it could be a man, I don't know, whose first sexual experience might have been a violation or whatever. Or maybe he came from like a very religious household which looked at sex as like very, like there was a lot of shame involved in sex. So subliminally, that man may not be able to get aroused because uh, subconsciously there's a lot of things that are attached to sex to him you know, subconsciously. Although he desires to make love, um, he has a lot of things going on in his mind imprinted behind, you know, the art of making love. And so part of her work was to break that. Like, you know, when you'll go to like a healer or a therapist, they might do like inner child work. She was really going there. You know, when was your first sexual encounter? Who was it with? How did it make you feel? Was it enjoyable? Like going there, you know? Um, you might even have like some sex therapists that put people under hypnosis because there's such um, a taboo in talking about sex that they might put someone under hypnosis so they can get the full story, so they can know where to start when it comes to healing them for their sexual issues. So she was really going there, you know, her prices, she said she, she made a living. She didn't have to do any other work but this because she was charging good money because she was getting it done. These men were healed after they spent some time with her, with her sessions. And believe it or not, their wives were very appreciative. And I mean, I can say if I was somebody's wife and the guy had ED, I would be grateful for that woman. Yeah, I would tip her. Like, oh yeah, now me and my, my husband can finally have some fun in the bedroom. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So she considered herself a healer and she considered herself doing the work. And um, when she came to America, they shut it down because a large part of the work that she would do would be touching the, the man and showing the wife, you know, um, this is how you touch your, your, your husband. And, you know, touching the scrotum, touching the shaft, touching the head, 
um, explaining all of the elements of sensitivity, where the most sensitive part of the, the penis was and all of those things and allowing the wife to, you know, touch her husband, allowing the wife to, you know, after she taught her, the wife how to get her husband aroused. And in America, they looked at that as prostitution. They considered that a hand job. And she was really insulted. Like it kind of like offered like a level of like, like it made her work and her profession seem trivial or sleazy. And uh, she was really appalled by that, you know? It, it was really like, she looked at it like America was ass backwards, you know? Being from Switzerland, being European, where those types of things are very more, very much more open. It's very much more of a culture uh, of acceptance. It's not a, these things aren't as stigmatized as they are in America. And so she literally, and I can, I can sense, you know, when someone's being genuine, um, and she was very sincere. Just her confusion on why um, they would shut down her profession and um, not allow her to do the healing work. And she had a big problem with America and American culture for that reason. And so men often seek, you know, open-mindedness that, you know, their their wives sometimes don't embody. And um, Kamala Harris, I know, had announced in her campaign that she was going to decriminalize sex work because sex workers who, you know, get would get sexually assaulted or raped often would not report to authorities um, out of fear of getting arrested. And so, you know, our culture has gone in the direction that sex work is not as taboo as it once was. But here's the question. For me, you know, I, I'm a musician, I'm an artist. And although I ask these types of things, and I'm also a um, collector of experiences in life, I know my lane. My lane is really my music and my dance and to create, you know, culinary arts and stuff like that. So I'm not saying, like I said, with the show, I was inviting a sex expert on. I'm not, I'm not the person who's devoted my life to this type of work or whatever. Nor am I a politician, right, who's devoted their life to like addressing, you know, political issues. Um, I'm a, I'm, I am a collector of experiences who is very open-minded to people's stories and their walks of life. And so um, I have to ask the question when it comes to these matters, you know, who does it serve? And that was my main point when I wanted to talk about sex and I wanted to talk about sex work and prostitution. Most of the girls that I met in LA were not rich women. And it happens, you know, there are women who are wealthy who do end up becoming sex workers, but it's so much more rare than women who have financial necessities, women who have mouths to feed, women who um, are trying to make ends meet, women who are trying to um, pay their rent, things like that. And so I just, I know that it flirts with the, con the conversation of exploitation. How much of it is a choice and how much of it is circumstantial? Because in Cali, you'll meet women that are willing to fight you if you say that, you know, prostitution is wrong. You will meet women willing to fight you. Like, how dare you? This is my body. And it is my choice who I choose to share my body with. How dare you? You will meet women that go that hard for sex work and prostitution. But I just want to ask the question, is this something that you genuinely want to do? Like growing up as a little girl where you're like, I want to be a hooker. Or is it circumstantial? Is it because of a monetary necessity? And, you know, I'm going to make the argument that it's possible that even, you know, with this, with this sexual liberation, you know, in, in our culture, um, if every woman was married, you know, who would the men have to have their fun with? Is it possible that men, specifically affluent men, created the whole culture? Because if every woman was married, protected and provided for, who would they have to sleep with and do the freaky things that they want to do with? And so women are like so gung-ho about like, you know, my body, my choice, sexual freedom, sexual liberation, but I'm, I'm a 
almost on the side that like you're kind of being played. It, I think that this might be like the ma the male agenda because a lot of men. I'm not speaking for all men, but a lot of men don't like monogamy. A lot of men do like the option of being able to like cheat on their wife or have multiple women. I'm just being honest here, guys. And so, who are they gonna cheat on their wives with? But the woman that doesn't have a husband. You know? So, I do believe, especially after my experience, I do believe like a lot of this stuff is coerced on like um, a larger level. You know, culturally, you see like, I, I mean, I've talked about female MCs and I'm like, how in my generation did we go from like Lauren Hills, Queen Latifah's, you know, where like to be a female MC was like an honor. It was like you were like on your throne, like you were like a princess or a queen of the community because you you had mastered the the art of 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 the word, right? Like like you couldn't just be anybody and be a female MC. Like you had to be like somebody who who was like mentally like there. You know what I'm saying? Like Queen Latifah, Lauren, like the ones that you know were kind of like smarter than the people around you. Like how do we go from that to? this like stripper thing. And I'm not putting anybody down here because I know blah, 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 here she goes with her self-righteous da da da, putting people down, no, but it's something to ask. Who created this? Who wanted so bad for women of color to be like seen as whores? And who does it serve? Who does it serve? I mean, every man has his fetish. Every man has his thing. You know, some men like, you know, like I've said before, some men like curvaceous women. Some men like plump women. Some men like petite women with really tight bodies. Some men have a chocolate fetish where they only want girls like my complexion. You know, some men like the lips. You know, some people have oil fixations. Some people, I mean, there's all types of things that stimulate and titillate people. But why have typically the women of color kind of been um, reduced to sex objects? You know, why, why, is it, why is it that? So these are just questions that I want people to ask, you know? Like, I don't have the answers to a lot of these things, but I think that it's not a bad idea. It might be worthwhile for me to, ask, to begin to ask these questions. We will continue these types of talks. Until next time, people, peace.